Albert Einstein. So I guess you know Albert Einstein. He did a lot of a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things. He invented special relativity. He invented general relativity. He was one, one of the main founders of quantum mechanics, of the whole of physics, basically. But weirdly enough, he didn't get the Nobel Prize in physics for neither of these works. He got the Nobel Prize of physics for something else, which is probably just as important as the other things he did. Albert Einstein was the man who who convinced the whole scientific community that matter was made of atoms. Now you might want that the interesting question is how did he prove it? How do you prove that matter is made of atoms? Especially when you're working at a patent office as he was back then. He had no instruments or exp no way of doing experiments. Well he went back uh, he, he he studied a prime that was an observation that was made by Robert Brown, a botanist, in 1828, so 100 years before him. So anybody could have done that. Okay. So what Robert Brown observed is that, is that when you put a grain of pollen in water, even though water was, the water was perfectly still, the grain of pollen would be moving, would be sort of erratically moving in water. And that was weird because water seemed still. And at that point, uh, people already knew about Newton's law of mechanics, so there was no way of explaining this motion. And the key insight of uh, Einstein was to imagine that water was actually made of these particles that was moving all, all around. But there were so many of them that it was impossible to describe them all. We had to consider that well, randomly, sometimes a particle would hit the grain of pollen. If it hit it from the right, the grain of pollen would be moving to the left. And you had all these random events that occur on the grain of pollen, and that's why it's moving in all directions. Okay, but how do you come up with, how can you convince the, the committee of that? Because this seems like random, it, it seems like you cannot predict anything about something that's fundamentally unpredictable. So how do you convince the whole scientific community that this is indeed what happens? Now the key idea of Einstein was an analytical theory, theoretical one. His, his idea was to look at the trajectory of the, the grain of pollen as you look towards infinity. That's the key idea of ergodic theory. You track the trajectories towards infinity. And so this, and he, he thought that the simplest way of modeling the, the, these random events was to think of what we call now a random walk. So random walk is at each point of time you're taking a step in a random direction, either north, south, east, or west. And if you look at each individual step, there's nothing to say. It's unpredictable. But the amazing thing is what happens when you look at a lot of steps as you look as time goes to infinity. Now, each color over here represents a different random world. And as you can see, they're all very different. But they all look kind of the same. They have sort of the same structure. What, what, what kind of structure is that? This is a fractal. This is a very fractal structure. And Einstein showed that the motion of the grain of pollen had this kind of structure. And this was the argument that convinced the whole scientific community of the existence of atoms. Einstein showed that the Brownian motion, the motion of the grain of pollen, looked a lot like this one. And this gave Albert Einstein the Nobel Prize in physics. So ergodic theory, when you apply it well, well, you can win a Nobel Prize in physics. You can also win a hundred billion dollar. That's the case of Google. Google applied ergodic theory. So the problem that uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page faced was how would I, like they wanted to to order the web, and they would, they were searching for a way of saying that such a, a web page was more important than the other one. And they were searching for a way to do that. And the way they did that is they imagined a random walk 
on the web. Okay, so the web is the set of all web pages. And imagine someone while working on the web, and at each step, he would be moving from a web page to another by clicking on, randomly on one of the link of the web page. Okay, so you're kind of jumping every time, but just picking randomly one, one of the links of the page. Now it seems that there's nothing to say, once again. If you look at each individual step, it's, it's unpredictable, there's nothing to say. But once again, if you look, as time goes to infinity and you track the trajectory of our imaginary web surfer, well, you see patterns emerging. What kind of patterns do you see? Well, you see that our, 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 our web surfer here will go to all the places of the web, nearly all. And he will come back to all the places of the web, all the web pages, an infinite amount of time. More precisely, if you look carefully, you see that the web surfer would be coming more often on some web pages than some others. And for instance, he would co be coming more often on Wikipedia than on Science for All, or today. <laughs> and, this, and this was interpreted by Sergey Brin as as Wikipedia being more important, being more relevant, as more people refer to it, than scienceforward.org today. <laughs> okay. And this was the key insight to order the web pages of, of, of the web, and clearly, well, Google is now a hundred billion dollar worth, several hundred billion dollar worth. Okay, so, so, okay, so every theory is very valuable. Now, maybe you're not interested in money, and maybe you're not interested in physics, uh, and you're doing math, so you'd be interested in having the Fields Medal. The Fields Medal is the highest honor in mathematics. Well, algorithm theory can also win you a Fields Medal. Uh, so, Ben Green and Terence Tao applied this idea of algorithm theory to study prime numbers. Now, one second, now, you, you, the, now, to study these prime numbers, what a lot of math machines have done is to look at each prime number, one after another. And the, you could study how you jump from a prime number to another one. But this is extremely complicated. If you look at each jump of prime numbers, it seems like there's nothing to say. But once again, if instead of looking at each step, you're looking towards infinity, you're looking at the trajectory towards infinity, then you can find new patterns emerging. In particular, Ben Green and Tanstow found a pattern by studying that, uh, which is this theorem that says that there's arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions in the primes. Uh, and this theorem uh, led uh, Tanstow to win uh, the Fields Medal in 2006. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question. So what does mean alpha long arithmetic So for every n, there is an arithmetic progression of n numbers, which is all made of prime numbers. But don't worry. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, now I couldn't end this section on algorithm theory without talking about the founder of uh, algorithm theory, uh, who is Raymond uh, Henri Poincaré. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Henri uh, Poincaré. So, uh, and this, because the story of uh, how he came up with that is also a very interesting one. Uh, so, in um, the late 19th century, the king of Sweden posed a problem to the mathematical community uh, to sort out the question of the stability of the solar system. And this was already an age old question. Right? A lot of mathematicians had already worked on this question. Uh, but the approach they used was every time to apply the Newton's laws of mechanics to, tra to sort of try to track the trajectories of all the planets. And this is very complicated because each planet is under the influence of the gravitational effects of all the other planets. And they, they don't really seem to cancel out. So it was nearly impossible to track the trajectories of, of all planets. <coughs> and the key idea of uh, Henri Poincaré was to invent this new approach of algorithm theory. Instead of looking at the trajectory of, of the Earth through time, which is very complicated, 
he looked at the trajectory if you look towards infinity. Now he used one property of Newton's law, which some, some conservative property of Newton's law of motions. Uh, and this probably implied that there was some, some, some pattern that would be emerging as we were towards infinity. Namely the fact that the solar system would be coming back at nearly its, all, uh, at nearly its, accuracy, its present state if you look far enough in the future. This is known as Poincaré recurrence theorem. If you look towards in, far enough into the future, the whole solar system will be coming back at nearly its position, uh, at nearly its initial state. In fact, it will be coming back an infinite number of times to nearly its present state. And that was the convincing argument that the solar system is stable. So as the story goes, he, 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 well, he proposed this solution and he was awarded the prize uh, by the king of Sweden. But then when it was going to be published, a uh, mistake was found. There was some flaw in Henri Poincaré's reasoning. Uh, now, you have to put yourself in, your, in his position. He was just awarded a prestigious prize. People found out that he was flawed. <laughs> Must have been, uh, it must have been very hard. It could have destroyed, it could have destroyed uh, most people. But not Poincaré. Poincaré was the kind of mathematician who, when he was faced with a problem, he would invent a whole new theory to sort of come around the problem. And in particular, in this case, he then invented chaos theory to give strong indication of the instability of the solar system. <laughs> Now, the work of Poincaré on chaos theory has kind of been forgotten just after him. Uh